So we've seen what neural networks are and how to use them for regression and for classification. But the real power of neural networks is not in doing classical machine learning tasks. Rather, it's in their flexibility to grow beyond that. The idea is that neural networks can be set up in a wild variety of different configurations to solve all sorts of different tasks. To give you a hint of that, we'll finish up by looking at a simple example, the autoencoder. Here's what it looks like. It's a particular type of neural network shaped like an hourglass. Its job is just to make the output as close to the input as possible, but somewhere in the middle is a small layer that functions as a bottleneck. We can set it up however we like with one or many fully connected layers. The only requirements are that one, one of the layers forms a bottleneck, that is, it has fewer nodes than the input and the output layer, and two, that the input layer is exactly the same size as the output layer. The idea is that we simply train the neural network to reconstruct the input. If we manage to train a network that does this successfully, then we know that, that whatever value the bottleneck layer takes for a particular input is a low-dimensional representation of that input, from which we can pretty well decode what the input was. So it must contain the relevant details. Note how powerful this idea is. We don't even need any labeled data. All we need is a large amount of examples, images or sentences, and with that we can already train an autoencoder. Here's the picture in detail. We call the bottom half of the network the encoder and the top half the decoder. We feed the encoder an instance from our data set, in this case an image, and all it has to do is reproduce that instance in its output. We can then use any loss that compares the output to the original input and produces a lower loss the more similar these two are. Then we just backpropagate the loss and train the whole thing by gradient descent. We haven't talked yet about how to feed a neural network an image, but for now we can just flatten the whole thing into a vector. Every color channel of every pixel becomes an input node, giving us in this case 128 times 128 times 3 inputs. That's a bit costly, but we'll see some more efficient ways to feed images to neural networks soon. Many loss functions would work here, but to keep things simple, we can stick with the squared error loss. We call the blue layer, the bottleneck, the latent representation of the input. If we train an autoencoder with just two nodes in the bottleneck layer, then we can plot in two dimensions what latent representation is assigned to each input. If the autoencoder works well, we expect to see similar images clustered together. For instance, people smiling versus people frowning, or men versus women. This is often called the latent space of a network. There's no need to read too much into that yet, but it is a phrase that will come back often. To show what this looks like, we've set up a relatively simple autoencoder. It uses a few tricks we haven't discussed yet, but the basic principle is just a neural network with a bottleneck and a squared error loss. The size of the bottleneck in this model is 256 nodes. We train this on a low resolution version of what is called the FFHQ dataset, a dataset of 70,000 images of faces, each with resolution 128 by 128. Here are the reconstructions after five full passes over the data, five epochs, after 25 epochs, after 100 epochs, and finally, after 300 epochs. At this point, the autoencoder has pretty much converged and the loss won't drop any further. You can see here the reconstructions next to the original data. The reconstructions are a little bit fuzzier, but you can clearly see that a lot of the information in the original image has been retained. Considering that each of these has been reduced to just 256 numbers and then reconstructed, it's not too bad of a result. So, now that we have an autoencoder, what can we do with it? We already know that we can use it for dimensionality reduction, but another thing we can do is interpolation. If we take two points in the latent space and draw a line between them, then we can pick evenly spaced points on that line and send all of them through the decoder, even though only the start and the end point of the line correspond to actual things that we've seen in the data. If the decoder is good and all of the points in the latent space decode to realistic faces, then this should give us a smooth transition from one point to the other 
and each point should result in a convincing example of our output domain. This is not a guaranteed property of an autoencoder trained like this, but if you're lucky, you might get results like the one shown here. Another thing we can do is to study the latent space based on the examples that we have. For instance, we can see whether smiling and non-smiling people end up in distinct parts of the latent space. We just label a small amount of instances as smiling and non-smiling, in this case just 20 of each. And if we're lucky, when we map these to the latent space by feeding them to the encoder, they form distinct clusters. If we compute the means of these clusters, we can draw a vector between them. We can think of this as a smiling vector. The further we push people along this line, the more the decoded point will look like a smiling person. This is one big benefit of autoencoders. We can train them on unlabeled data, which is cheap, and then use only a very small number of labeled examples to annotate the latent space. In other words, autoencoders are a great way to do semi-supervised learning. Once we've worked out what the smiling vector is, we can then manipulate photographs to make people smile. We just encode their picture to the latent space, we add the smiling vector times a small scalar to control the effect, and then we decode the manipulated latent representation. If the autoencoder understands smiling well enough, the result will be the same picture but manipulate it so that the person will smile. In the middle, we have the decoding of the original data, and to the right, we see what happens if we add an increasingly large multiple of the smiling vector. To the left, we subtract the vector, which makes the person frown or increases the extent to which they frown. With a bit more powerful model and a little face detection, we can see what some famously moody celebrities might look like if they smiled. So, what we get out of an autoencoder depends on which part of the model we focus on. If we keep both the encoder and the decoder, then we get a network that can help us manipulate data in this way. We map data to the latent space, tweak it there, and then map it back out of the latent space with the decoder. If we keep just the encoder, we get a powerful dimensionality reduction method. We can use latent space representations as the feature for another model that does not scale well to a high number of features. One final thing we can do is we can throw away the encoder and keep only the decoder. In that case, the result is a generator network, a network that can generate fictional examples of the sort of thing we have in our dataset. In our case, pictures of people who don't exist. Here's how that works. The encoder will map the data to a point cloud in our latent space. We don't know what this point cloud will look like, but we'll make an educated guess that a multivariate normal distribution will make a reasonable fit. We then fit such a distribution to our data in the latent space. And if it does fit well, then the regions of our latent space that, could ha that get high probability density are also the regions that are likely to decode to realistic looking instances of our data. With that, we can sample a point from this normal distribution, feed it through the decoder, and get a new data point that looks like it could have come from our data. This is a bit like the interpolation example. There we assumed that the points directly in between two latent representations should decode to realistic examples. Here we assume that all the points that are anywhere near points in our data, as captured by this normal distribution, decode to realistic examples. This is the point cloud of the latent representations of our example in light blue. We plot the first two dimensions of the 256 dimensions of our latent space. To these points, we fit a multivariate normal distribution in 256 dimensions, and we sample 400 new points, shown here in red. In short, we sample points in the latent space that do not correspond to the data, but that are sufficiently near the data that we can expect the decoder to give us something realistic. If we take these red points and we feed them to the decoder, this is the result. They don't look as good as the reconstructions, but it's clear that we are looking at approximations of human faces. This has given us a generator, but we have little control over what the cloud of representations looks like. 
We just have to hope that it looks enough like a normal distribution that our normal distribution makes a good fit. We've also seen that this interpolation works well, but it's not something we've specifically trained the network to do. In short, the autoencoder is nice, but it's not a very principled way of getting a generator network. You may ask if there is a way to train a generator from first principles, perhaps starting with the maximum likelihood objective. The answer to all of these questions is the variational autoencoder, which we will discuss in a few weeks. For now, let's recap and end the lecture here. We've seen what neural networks are and how they are trained. We've seen what a loss function is and how they are derived from first principles. And we've seen our first example of a complex architecture, the autoencoder. In the next lecture, we will focus on the missing ingredient in our training algorithm. Given a neural network and a loss function, how do we work out its gradient?